So I thought in introducing Dave, I should Google him and see if he has a wiki page. And, and I found that David Phillip is a German professional footballer who currently <laughs> plays midfield for FC Victoria Kohl. Uh, born in Hamburg, 22 years old, very accomplished, but it's the tier three league, so he's got a ways to go yet. Um, I also found that Dave Phillip is an award-winning sound designer who founded the company Noiseworks, uh, a sound design and music company. So uh, I think we're in the presence of a polymath, but I think for Dave Phillip, who's presenting this morning or this afternoon, this evening, I've been up many hours. <laughs> uh, he's a fisheries biologist, very accomplished, and very well known, who examines genetics or uses genetics, uh, studies genetics, reproductive biology, spatial ecology of fishes, and the effects of fisheries on natural populations, and has a huge range of, of studies, including many studies that have been done here at the Queen's University Biological Station. He's a principal scientist emeritus at the Natural History Survey, University of Illinois. Many of you will undoubtedly know that already. Currently serves as chair of the board of directors for the Fisheries Conservation Foundation, FCF. Um, and Dave uh, started working up here in the mid-Jurassic, uh -huh. 1982. <laughs> and he's been studying the reproductive ecology of bass populations in Apinican and neighboring lakes since 1990. Um, he also does a, a lot of work outside of uh, North America through his association with the FCF and is working on conservation projects with collaborators uh, in Bhutan, Pakistan, Thailand, and the Bahamas. So feel sorry for Dave that he has to travel to all of those wonderful places. Um, and the title of Dave's talk is up here. So uh, take it away, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ah. Best part about being the speaker is you get to take this off. Wow. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be up here because I think it is a 50-50 chance that this week, 40 years ago, was the first CUBE seminar I ever went to. Mark Gross gave a presentation on the alternative life histories in Bluegill while I was up here for a week. That was the first year I was here, so 1982. And I think that was the last week in June. So I'm really happy to be here. <clears throat> what I want to do in my presentation is to address two questions. One is, um, do bass need protection from angling during their spawning period? And if they do, then what is the best strategy to give them that protection? And so I'm going to show you a, a, a series of experimental studies that we had going on that, that answer that question. Um, and then I'm going to go through how the history of angling in, in Opinicon has been shaping the, the bass populations over the last few decades. Then talk about uh, a proposal that we're doing for an alternative method of managing uh, bass fishing, et cetera, and then talk some general stuff at the end. And as I said, um, <clears throat> This goes back a long way. We started, we first started um, working on bass in 1990. It all came about with some of the guides from the Opinicon and some of the other surrounding lakes that came to Frank Phelan, who was the manager of the station and who has been a lead part of this um, study since the very inception of it. And, uh, and we, we uh, started talking about what we could do in eight, 1989 and then initiated some studies in 1990 that were uh, supported by the ministry in Spirit and by the OFAH, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, with actual uh, some dollars, but and it since has just spread through that. But this is a list of kind of the A team that are, of people that have been involved in the project and are still involved with the project. But there are literally well over a hundred people that have worked on this project throughout the years. Uh, many students, undergraduates, uh, some that are now full professors, grad students, even some. Uh, high school kids, and I think uh, Madison Phillips started when she was in like fifth grade. So uh, the, our kids always had to swim. You could, there's no free lunch here. Um, <clears throat> so we also have major partners. Or the Fisheries Conservation Foundation funds a lot of this now. Uh, Steve Cook's lab up at Carleton. Obviously, the Queen's Bio Biolog Biological Station has been involved right from the beginning. This is probably the best place in the world, I think, to do freshwater fisheries research. <clears throat> and then we also have a new recent partner too, which is Canuck Nature. 
and the Canoc Institute, which is outside of Montebello, Quebec. Okay. The key to understanding all of this stuff today is to actually understand in detail the reproductive ecology of bass and their life history, their actual life history, not what everybody thinks is going on. So I want to go through that a little bit so that we all know, because that comes into play directly with the various regulations. There are some failures and why some why some fail and why some won't. <clears throat> okay, so when water turns about 12 degrees, 12 or 13 degrees, male bass, both largemouth and smallmouth, move into the shallows. Like this guy, this is a smallmouth bass on a nest in the St. Lawrence River. Um, and uh, they clean out the substrate on the bottom, make a little depression in it with their caudal fin, and then wait until females show up. And females show up when it gets to be about 13 or 14 degrees because they've hydrated eggs over a 24 hour period, a little batch of the hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of oocytes they have, a small batch, they hydrate them up overnight and then ovulate and spawn the next day. They go around when it when it's time to spawn, they cruise the shorelines, looking at all the males, checking out who they think is going to be the best father. All the males are out there trying to court them into their nests and they choose which one to spawn with. Females have all of the choice in who spawns with whom. They come in. If she decides to spawn with this lucky male, they come in and they circle around their nest OK for maybe one hour, maybe five hours. And every once in a while, this is the female, always blotchy, that's the male, always uni unicolor. She goes over on her side, extrudes like 10 to 15 eggs every 20 seconds or so. He fertilizes them, they keep on going until she runs out of the eggs that she has ovulated. And then she gets up and leaves. Another female may come in, a male may spawn with two or three or four females, maybe only one if they, she had a lot of eggs, but they spawn with multiple females. <clears throat> but after all of that spawning is done, the females leave and the male stays alone for the entire duration of parental care. So the eggs, when they're fertilized, go down onto the, there we go, onto the substrate. Oh, fuzzy fingers. Okay, they go down into the substrate. Here's a bunch of eggs you can see there. There's a smallmouth on his nest. This is not a huge batch of eggs, medium. <clears throat> and they stick to the they stick to these rocks. And he's providing now all of the parental care while they're eggs, while they're larvae in the nest, and while they're free swimming fry. And so they they fan the eggs until they hatch, and then you defend they defend the eggs and the little larvae and the free swimming little fish. Um, from brood predators. All other fish around there want to eat these guys because they're little nutrient balls and the male's job to protect them. So this shows when they hatch, these, these are pretty advanced larvae in the nest. When they hatch, they don't have eyes, they don't have anything. They're just a little yolk ball with a tiny little tail. They can't see anything and they can barely move. These are uh, probably 10 day old smallmouth bass fry. They turn jet black. And then eventually though, so they're in the nest for maybe three to four days as eggs. Then they hatch and are there for another 10 or 12 days before they become free swimming. And they come up off the nest and, and hover above the nest and they'll spread out. Or in the case of largemouth bass, they stay as a fry ball and they move around in various places with the male. So there's the male looking through and here are some fry that are his. These are probably maybe two weeks, 10 or 10 days to two weeks post swim up. They're about three quarters of an inch. They're not yet independent, okay? The male needs to guard those fry until they reach independence. Joe Brown working out of this station back in 1984 and 85 showed that largemouth and smallmouth bass offspring don't recognize predators and can't avoid them until like five weeks post fertilization. If this male is removed, these fish don't know what to do, the little babies. Sunfish immediately move in and eat them. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of a summary from birth to death, but of, its, of their life history. There's no time scale here, okay? So they're eggs for a while, then they hatch and they come in and then they become free swimming and they're fry. This is about 
four and a half to six week period, depending upon the temperature of the water. Obviously, warmer temperatures, they move faster. Then at independence, the male leaves, and these guys are up and ready and able to fend for themselves. They make it through their first summer, they go through the winter, and they come out of, at the end as one-year-old juveniles. And then they stay as juveniles for a number of years before they become an adult, and then they could be adult for a number of years. We've gotten smallmouth bass that have been 24 years old, but others don't make it that long. The age at maturation is very plastic in these fish. So the earliest they can, they can change from juveniles to adults is probably three years when they're maybe nine or 10 inches. But other fish delay maturation until they're seven or eight years old and much larger. <clears throat> we'll get to that a little bit later. So when we talk about reproductive success, it's not how many eggs, it's not how many nests are out there or how many fish spawned, it's after all of the parental care and brood predation and everything else that happens, how many independent free swimming fry were made? How many babies made it to here? That's the reproductive success of an individual. And then for a whole lake, it's the summation for all of the individual males that are out there. <clears throat> Recruitment is the, is basically the year class strength. How many individuals make it through this period to come out the other end to become juveniles that then become adults, okay? We measure the annual recruitment after they've gone through the first summer and winter and have made it as one plus individuals. We can tell them because they're this big and they have different coloration than two-year-olds. <clears throat> Actually, the year class is probably set way back here, but we measure it out here. <clears throat> okay. All right, now there's a lot of, bit, lot of papers, our lab from a whole variety of other labs that have looked at the impact of angling on the reproductive success of an individual male. And it, everyone agrees that it's never a really good day for a bass to meet an angler, <clears throat> um, but, you know, and, and so we've done a lot of studies on the stress and on the amount of uh, abandonment, et cetera, that's going on. And what happens when a male is angled off the nest is that the sunfish that are all around there hesitate because the male that's in there guarding, if they ever got too close, he'd whale them. If they were small enough to eat, he'd eat them, but they'd whale. So they don't go near that nest, but they're constantly trying to sneak back when he chases somebody else off, somebody will come in and get it. So they're watching. <clears throat> And so 30 seconds goes by and all of a sudden, you know, they realize Bob's not there anymore. And so one fish goes in and when he doesn't get pounded by Bob the bass, they all go in and start eating. 50% um, of the eggs are gone in the first eight to 10 minutes. And so, and pretty much after an hour, it's, it's gone. But if a male is angled and released immediately and they can get back within a minute, a minute so that before lots of damage goes on and there's not much stress involved, they will maybe be able to take back over guarding their nests. They always come back and then they assess what's going on. If there's a bunch of fish in there, if they have enough energy, they'll drive them off. If there are too many fish, they can't clean it out and then they just abandon. But they'll come back and clean it out and assess how many babies are in there. And at a certain threshold, it's just not worth it for them to go through three more weeks of not eating because these bass lose maybe 10 to 15 percent of their body weight and so they'll abandon it if it's early enough in the season they'll try to re-nest and spawn up here the spawning window between first egg laid and last egg laid by the females is about two weeks so they got to be quick to do that and invariably the re-nesters don't become successful it's not a very good strategy but they're trying to recoup <clears throat> so that's the situation um, and everybody across the board agrees that there is the certainly with catch and harvest the reproductive success is gone with catch and release there is the potential for real damage to the nest depending upon how it's handled etc and multiple recaptures is certainly not a, a good thing for the health of that for the stamina of the fish and its ability to 
re-guard, re-take over the nest guarding. <clears throat> However, there's still a big debate going on whether or not the damage done from angling on nesting males translates to a reduction in recruitment at the end. Does it impact actual year class strength? <clears throat> and uh, that debate still rolls on. Traditional thinking wait a minute, says that <clears throat> recruitment doesn't depend on reproductive success or spawning success. Everything is so variable with environmental factors that they rule the roost, that the environment, stochastic things determine good year classes and bad year classes, not the degree of, of spawning. <clears throat> and they go, and further on, it's because bass have so many eggs are laid out there. Each female may have, you know, I've, I've heard quotes of 100,000 eggs. They may have 100,000 oocytes, but they don't lay 100,000 eggs. So, you know, a big nest of, of smallmouth bass may have 3,000, a large nest of largemouth bass that have much smaller eggs may have 20,000, okay? But that's still a lot. And so the, the, the thought is there are so many eggs out there, it only takes a few successful pair to repopulate the lake. Therefore, if angling destroys a few nests, what's the problem? It will just be through compensation, there will be more survival from the other nests. <clears throat> is there any evidence for that? Actually, no. Um, there are three or four papers that are routinely cited. Two of them aren't even dealing with the same, with this, with this story. And the other two suffer from such fatal flaws in their experimental design, in the way they analyze the data, in all the conclusions drawn, that, they're, that we use those as an example for graduate students on how to read a paper and don't just take everything you read as truth because what their, their conclusions are just bogus. So there really is no evidence at all for that. <clears throat> as one might surmise by now, our hypothesis is quite different from that. We say that in fact, recruitment does depend on reproductive success. Even though there's lots of environmental variation, all that environmental variation is going into determining how many males and females actually nest, what the success rate is of those things, whether there's storms and all of that, but that all lays and changes the amount of reproductive success. And so if there's if there's lost nest due to storms, the year class will drop. If there's lost nest due to angling, the year class will drop. That's our hypothesis. And what it 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 relies on this relationship that recruitment <clears throat> depends directly upon the amount of fry produced, reproductive success a straight line, a direct relationship. Okay, so in a given lake, if, if in the lake there are X amount of independent fry produced, you expect X amount, X prime amount of recruitment, right? Oink, oink. <clears throat> if, however, in another year, or for some other reason, here we go, we only got Y, amount of fry produced, then you expect Y amount of a Y prime amount of bass. There's that relationship. <clears throat> well, is there any evidence for that? Well, there wasn't back in 1990. So we launched into a field study based out of, whoops, there, out of Queens, right? There's a picture of the boathouse. <clears throat> so after our discussions with all that, we felt we needed to try to uh, deliver some of these data. And so we, what we wanted to do was to establish whether or not that relationship held. And so for three different water bodies, a smallmouth bass river, a smallmouth bass lake, and Lake Opinicon, which is predominantly largemouth, but does have some smallmouths in it, we monitored for certain study sites. Every year, we determined the amount of successful fry and recruitment. And the way we determine the amount of successful fry was to snorkel our study areas and map nests. Here's number 50. Here's his nest. And we put nest tags down. Okay. And we would, we would find all the nests and put them on a detailed map. 
I have one in my suitcase or my backpack. <clears throat> and when we found that nest, we'd record the total length, whatever, what species, small mouth or large mouth, the total length, because we had a, an 11 and a half inch ruler in our hand, uh, the developmental stage of the fry when we saw it, so we could determine back date to the spawning date. The mating success, that is the number of eggs that were in the nest, it was a score of one to five. And then we monitored it every three to four days for presence and absence to see if it made it all the way through independence or was abandoned somehow or whatever. And then based on the, the egg score, fry score, we could determine how many, how many fry each one of the successful nests produced. And then you could sum them to get the lake-wide average. And that gave us that one, that gave us the, the X value. Now to get that value, the, the following year, we would visually swim, or well, not visually swim, we'd swim and visually count the number of one plus bass. And so we do this 10 or 12 times with different swimmers and so that we could average them out and get variation and, and we could basically count. It was the best way to sample fairly large numbers of fish that we, we found that, that would work. Netting and Shocking and all that didn't work nearly as well as this did. <clears throat> okay, so there it is. One year took the swims to do, to get the x-axis, and then the next year to get the y-axis. So each one of those two-year combinations gave us one point. So what did we find? This is for one of those three. So the number of bass surveyed, this is the relative young of the year, Recruitment, so this is annual recruitment versus the fry produced. And there's a pretty good direct relationship there. I think the R squared value is like 0.8 something. So that's pretty, very strong evidence for that. <clears throat> so our conclusion, in fact, was that really recruitment was directly dependent upon reproductive success, which was critical for our hypothesis. <clears throat> okay. But that hypothesis also then predicts that without angling, if you have X producing X prime, but because after S, uh, angling nesting bass, there, were, uh, there was abandonment and lost broods, it dropped down to A, well then the, rec the recruitment should also drop down to A. That's the question that was going on. That was one that was, has been resisted vehemently by a variety of areas. <clears throat> Do we have, is there any really, was there any evidence that that actually happens? Well, there wasn't really. Um, so we initiated a while ago, a whole lake study where we had a lake at, on the Cubes property and three lakes up at Canoc Nature um, as partners. We designed a 12 year study that had four private lakes. Uh, so we controlled all of the access and we rotated the management. So on one year, it had absolutely no angling for anything on the lake uh, uh, during the bass spawning season. And in the other, we put people on the lake and they were directed to fish the shorelines and, and we monitored the, uh, the, the amount of angling that went on and how many fish they caught, et cetera. Uh, and it, the pressure that we were shooting for was eight man hours per kilometer of shoreline during the bass spawning season. So that was four passes of a boat with two anglers in it fishing at one kilometer an hour, four times around that lake. And we had people fish the whole lake. Our research team fished at each lake twice and then there were others that we had come in and also fish. Okay, so that's, that's what we did. And then the following year, we assessed recruitment. So that each lake had four, or each lake had years planned we actually, the, the results were so striking, we stopped after eight years rather than go four more years. And this shows the results for one lake, Mills Lake up at the Canoc. The bars show the relative recruitment values. Green has no angling, red has catch and release angling. All four of the no angling are very high recruitment. All four of the, uh, the, the catch and release only, no live bait, had significant decreases, very dramatic. In fact, these are the four lakes. That was Mills Lake. That was the least dramatic of them all. And there were bigger differences between angling and non-angling in the other three lakes. That shows the difference in four lakes over eight years, 
the difference between whether there's catch and release angling on nesting fish or not. <clears throat> That's an experiment. Is there any evidence, essentially, do we see it in our public lakes? So remember, one of the three lakes that we've been swimming is this one right here, Opinicum, since 1990. And I love this. Here's a map of Opinicum in case some of you aren't here. We are right now right here. There, I love this map, copyrighted by Queen Elizabeth. Been in the news a little bit lately. Um, and has some, has some interesting things. There's the canal, et cetera. And this shows you where you want to fish for all sorts of things, including walleye, which aren't any in this lake. But um, <clears throat> they don't, I, I don't think they have any. So, so to their credit, they didn't mark it anywhere. So that's good. Uh, so this is where we did our study. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you the trajectory of different spawning metrics. And what I've done is I've just lumped in five and six year segments, just to make it more simply to look at. And what I've done is I've standardized everything to the value of this first five year segment. So whatever this value was, I put it 100% and all these others are relative to that. And I'll show you what I mean. This first one is the total number of nests in the study area, made to 100. Actually, it bumped up a little bit for the first two, first 10 years or so. <clears throat> But then recently, over the last several bit, it has dropped. So there's actually, you know, less 20% less than what was up up here. In fact, that's probably an overestimate because with abandonment going on, more so than here, there, a lot of this is due to re-nesting. But essentially, what this line indicates is the number of adult males in the lake. So adult males are going down. This is the total number of eggs deposited in those nests, okay? And it is tracking it pretty well too. So it, that's kind of a measure of the female population. So it's also dropping. Now we get into it. This is the number of successful nests. So a lot more, a lot fewer nests are being, are, are making it to, the full the full range of uh, parental care. So actually, the number of successful nests has decreased 50% in the last little bit, the last 10 years or so, last couple of decades. That's pretty significant. As one would expect, since there was a drop in successful nests, there's also a drop in the number of surviving fry. Okay, so everything's going down, but what happens to recruitment? This is now, those are all the spawning metrics. Here's the recruitment from the, the year following, and it's going down as well. Okay, so the history of the lake is very consistent with the hypothesis that we have. As, as successful spawning goes down, so does recruitment. But why is that happening? That's the hook wounding rate that we see. When we swim these fast nests, we look at each male, look him right in the eye, and you can see his whole mouth, and we can, we can mark down whether or not, and in what spot it was, whether there's a hook wound. Now, we only see, we, we've done experiments, only about a quarter of the fish that are actually caught and released show hook wounds, so these are underestimates by fourfold. But the bottom line is that, although it stayed low for a while, the last 15 years, hook wounding rates out on this lake have skyrocketed. And that would explain all of the drops here because all of this going down is history of poor recruitment. Okay? <clears throat> all right. The problem is that the regulation that's designed to protect the bass is a closed season. The problem comes in is that there is an open season for a lot of other species, pike, crappie, all sunfish, and everything else. And so we can have bass spawning right next to rock bass, spawning right next to pumpkin seeds in there where pike are, maybe, you know, and stuff. So it, it, there are a number of bass that are caught inadvertently by anglers who are trying to fish for pike, et cetera. Unfortunately, there are also are some anglers that are going in saying that they're fishing for these species but they're not. I mean, they're using bass lures 
on top of bass nests. In this lake, you can spot a bass from 100 yards away, a bass nest, no, 100 feet away. So, you know, you can go there. So here's the problem. There's a, there's a, a group, you know, with six or eight, I think, um, floating down this shoreline. And they fished that shoreline, say eight anglers fishing that shoreline. They fished about 500 meters in about a, an hour. So that's a little bit more than, it's about half the speed that we were fishing. We're fishing it in our experiment. But right there was a whole year's worth of angling pressure on that shoreline, just right there. They were there that morning, that they were there for three straight days, morning and afternoon. So, you know, that's a good spot to fish, obviously, but they weren't keeping them, they were releasing, okay? But the problem comes in is those males were put, being pulled off their nests, okay? We don't know how many went back, that's not a place that we monitor, but we see that happening in our monitoring sites as well. <clears throat> So the closed season isn't working. Throughout this lake, the closed season does not protect one single bass. In 2000, in, at the end of this year on 2017 was our last year. On average, every male bass in Lake Opinicon was caught about two and a half times. Okay. All right, so our solution is to use bass spawning sanctuaries. Not the permanent sanctuaries that are on the lake at Murphy's Bay and Darling's Bay, which are permanently closed year round and don't protect the spawning bass. They're basically swamps um, that were, it was a feel good exercise back in the 50s by everybody. Uh, but we, what we're saying is to protect good spawning areas just during the bass spawning season, okay? And then open it up to legal fishing after the, after the spawn's done. Protect the recruitment, okay? <clears throat> so let's get into that. Back in 2018, that's when we were, at the end of this, we were talking to the ministry and then that's what we were thinking we would try to do. So we went out in 2019, looking at various places uh, that might be spawning sanctuaries. And we set up these surveys of swimming in areas that would be spawning sanctuaries and in control areas that wouldn't be. And so we swam those and monitored everything we did with all those colored circles, okay? And we were gonna do that for three years to get a pre-data. So there's a backy design, before, after, control, impact. So you need to have data from inside and outside the sanctuary before the sanctuary goes in, and then after the sanctuary goes in and see if there's a difference, see what difference it makes. <clears throat> then the pandemic hit. So we weren't allowed to swim. Um, we weren't, the data wouldn't have been normal because it was not a normal year. So it couldn't have been a pre-year, but luckily Aaron, who is involved in this and is, is key in this whole study, lived here on site. We couldn't get across the border. A number of the students weren't allowed to come down to here, but because he lived on the site and had a boat on the site, he could collect the data from Lake Opinicon and did. Yeah, that was big. So from heaven came this whole lake, no fishing experiment that just dropped, right? It was a, a, amazing. So anyway, we compared, I'm gonna show you the results for this, this, this was our study through 2017. Then we got 2019, no COVID, 2020, COVID. Loads of fishing, not much fishing. And how do we know that? Because those are the hook wounding rates. So in 2019, which had a beautiful Victoria Day weekend and a beautiful Memorial Day weekend, which is the kiss of death for the nesting bass, the hook wounding was stratospheric, okay? In 2020, it was way down here. And in fact, I think those were like three fish or so in Deadlock Bay that somebody snuck out in Deadlock Bay and did some fishing because they were right near each other. <clears throat> What's the total number of nests? It's about the same. I mean, this is the same population from year to year. There was more here, probably because of re-nesting, but it, it's also different years, but it wasn't terribly different, but more nests in 2019, more eggs were laid in 2019, but the success rate was very different. Terrible success rate compared to the five-year average before it. Great success rate in the COVID year. 
<clears throat> Same thing with the surviving fry, which is what you would expect. So reproductive success was very different. So how did recruitment go? Bam. OK. There is no year class in 2019. I mean, we hardly ever see a three year old bass now. We never saw but but a very few one year olds. But 2020 was by far the biggest recruitment year in this lake. And we started a study with the Rito Lakes Environmental Fund with Steve Cook's lab and stuff. And so we're swimming other lakes. Uh, Sand, Opinicon, Indian, Upper, Big, Lower, Rito, Charleston and Devil. And this is seen in every one of them. So every one of them is suffering from poor recruitment during angling years, but was huge in 2020. And in fact, 2021 was exactly the same. We haven't, we haven't swum to count that number yet, but just being out there swimming all these nests, there are one-year-old bass all over the place and two-year-old bass all over the place from 2020. Unfortunately, 2022 is back to here. I mean, this it's going to be another <clears throat> bad hook wounding year and a very poor recruitment year. OK, so knowing all of that, what's the next step? And we felt that it was time to go to the ministry and say we have we didn't get started with this, but it's time to get a study going. So we are proposing um, a pilot study with these bass, bass spawning sanctuaries on two lakes. It'd be Opinicon and Charleston Lake, two very different lakes. Opinicon is mostly largemouth bass, very shallow, very productive, weedy. Charleston is very deep, 300 feet versus 29 feet, um, and uh, almost all smallmouth bass. So two very different lakes, so we'll be able to test that in, in, in things. The spawning window for Opinicon is very early. Charleston is much later in, in the year. Charleston is still got fish that aren't even free swimming right now. <clears throat> OK, and we would put we do last year. No, this year and next year as before years and then three years of instituting this, the, the. Sanctuaries, OK, so this let's let, just look at this. I want to show you the sanctuaries. Remember this this here's old Google Earth Lake Opinicon. OK, this is this is where we are now. Chafee's locks, Davis locks. This is Brooks Bay, Eight Acre Island, Sheep Island, and this is Deadlock Bay down here. OK, <clears throat> they become important. This is the. The, the light green areas are the spawning are the bass spawning sanctuary zones that the ministry uh, took our recommendations and expanded on. So we said we would we pr uh, proposed two areas and they said uh, it's going to be easier and better if we just make them bigger and squarer. So this is the, so this is basically all of Deadlock Bay, Brooks Bay, and then this shoreline in between there from Joe's Point, at Snake Island, Brooks Point, et cetera. That would be one sanctuary, huge bass spawning areas in this. And then this is um, from Penn Point to one end of Eight Acre Island down to Cow Island, and they're in all there. This is Cubes area. This is a real higher area for smallmouth bass. So with these two zones, we think we can protect 60% of the largemouth bass nests and over 70% of the smallmouth bass nests. And the reason we think that is because three different times, three different years, we have swum the entire shoreline of Lake Opinicon. That means every little nook and cranny, every little thing like this, everything, every little rock, and counted all of the nests. It was a big operation, but we had a lot of swimmers. So we have a good sense of where they're all spawning. And there are some really big hotspots for spawning areas. OK, this would taking less than 10 percent of the shoreline in the lake, being able to protect more than half the spawning area. <clears throat> Eventually. After well here, let me finish this. This is I don't know if you're familiar with Charleston Lake, a gorgeous lake. It's twisted because I couldn't fit it on this slide. This is one I made. <clears throat> so it's north is that way. OK, and so this is uh, Webster Bay up here. That's the main Charleston there. And the outlet is down here just to show you what's going on. <clears throat> and. These would be the two areas. This is the center island complex. So Charleston is up there. This is back north this way. So this would be 
all of these big islands here, big shallow water, lots of rocks, well protected, just a smallmouth bass factory. <clears throat> this is Annie's Hole in here and Sand Bay. Um, and so this would be in here. And this is probably one of the few really good largemouth bass spawning areas. So with this, again, we think we can we can protect a good proportion of the really productive smallmouth and largemouth bass spawning areas. <clears throat> okay. But what we need to do to make this happen, and this is the process we're working through right now with the MNR FMZ 18 approval we've gotten and the, um, the technical committee, we need to get it legally recognized as a special regulation for these bass spawning sanctuaries. So it'll come out in the book, right? The 2024 book, well, it would happen, 2024. So it'll come out in that. It's pushing through. Everybody that we've run into is highly in favor of it. I don't know if you know Joff's, uh, Joff Cote. He's been extraordinarily proactive, helpful, and everything else, writing it us all out in the right forms. I'm, it looks like it's going to go. We, we need to get our regulations in uh, by fall for next year for it to get regulations written up for the 2024. So that's good. But once that, if that all happens, which looks like it probably will, then we're going to need adequate signage around the lake so that anglers know what's going on in the things like that. Our foundation will work with the ministry to do that. We'll, we're, we'll probably pay for a lot of it. Um, there's got to be education and outreach. Again, we'll work with them to develop pamphlets, et cetera. We need going to need pamphlets to hand to anglers that are inside the sanctuary that want to know why they shouldn't be fishing there at the boat ramps and everything else probably have town meetings about this and put out um, you know informational videos and all sorts of stuff on why we should have that we'll do that and we need a research team and that'll we'll have graduate students and undergrads etc they're the best researchers out there um, you know there'll probably be some at Carl certainly at Carleton University with Steve's group because he's key to all of this and then maybe some at the University of Illinois you know, we're looking for good graduate students because this project will make you famous. No. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> With all that said, everything looked pr pretty promising, but I want to I want to just want to say this. I just read this yesterday on a blurb. This is the fishing wire. This is where we have a, a there's a disconnect. OK, St. Lawrence River is set to host Bass Nation Northeast Regional. Well, it was it was January, July, June. But. 20 to 22 to 24, but this was beforehand. OK, one of the pros said, you know, the bass will be in all stages of the spawn. That's why they did it then right there in 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 the St. Lawrence River, because the bass are all going to be spawning. Yes, I think you're going to be able to do a lot of things. You are going to be able to catch fish shallow that are roaming. You're going to be able to catch fish deep and you're going to be able to catch some fish off the beds. And he goes on on and on about where how you fish fish off beds and you know a lot of these pros are thinking that there's no harm coming they're not catching these they're not catching the males off the bed because they're fishing in 10 feet of water or more well let me tell you in the St. Lawrence River the average depth of the spawning in the sites that we swim is three and a half meters they're spawning 20 feet down so if you catch a fish at 20 feet this that's not a female and there was a tournament I don't know 25 years ago July 1st in Kingston, we went there to take some samples with Corey and stuff. And, you know, they said, we're, these are all, these are all females. You know, they, look how big they are. They were all, you know, 20 plus inch, beautiful small mouths. We'd pick them up, sperm, sperm, sperm. We didn't even find a female. We went through 50 something fish and not one of them was a female. They were all males off the nest, just having spawned. Now, here's the, here's the issue. 200 and 120 boats, two fishermen each, right, in there can weigh weigh in five fish. That's 1,200 bass getting weighed in, taken off. Probably 90% or more will be males. Once they're taken off and put in that boat, their reproduction is done. Okay, if, even if they all survive and are released and all that stuff, their reproduction is done. And there's going to be three days of that. So that's 5,000 fish. For sure, but you can also cull fish, right? So they're going to catch five fish. They're going to catch probably 50 fish a piece on the St. Lawrence River in the middle of spawning. They don't. They're lame. Um, so that you know, but say just 10. 
Uh, now you're up to like 7,000 fish in three days. That's not good. If I was a fisherman, which I am, but if I was one that lived in Ontario or New York, which I guess I do, uh, I'd be really upset that these guys and other people associated with that tournament are making a lot of money at the expense, and really of recruitment, at the expense of our public resource. Okay, now I, I'm not I'm not opposed to legitimate bass tournaments. You know, I I like non-weigh-in tournaments. I like catch and release tournaments without having to bring them back and not, without having to displace them. But tournaments that are in the spawning season are just ruthlessly bad, as right out here fishing is before the season opens. So. Now that I've gotten my rant off, that's good. <clears throat> so the bottom line is that I, you know, I think we need to be more responsible. This is there's serious times, and it's going to take some serious people to do serious things to make this work, because the 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 future of the fisheries are going down, and there's an easy way to fix for bass fisheries. I think anyway to protect the recruitment. We haven't even talked about what the population is doing. These populations in, in here and particularly in Charleston are changing. They're getting much smaller. And the reason they're getting smaller is because the numbers of adults out there are diminishing. And so, as I said, with centrarchid fish, bass and sunfishes, their age of mat maturation is very plastic. As the larger males are taken away, smaller males are able to mature up. We're seeing nine and 10 inch smallmouth bass on nests in Charleston and 10 and 11 inch largemouth bass. And we're seeing them here too. And that means that these fish, 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you'd never see a, a fish on a nest in Charleston smaller than 14 inches. So this is changing. And, and you, can ch you can fish a population down in size pretty quickly, but it's an evolutionary process to get back up. You know, it'll fix itself, you know, and maybe pretty quickly, like only two or three hundred years. OK, so this is something that we have to worry about is how our angling is impacting the behavior and the evolutionary trajectory of the fish that were in there. So we need to know that and take care of it. And what's important is that we look at long term management strategies. We need to be talking about 50 years from now because our particularly somebody my age, our trajectories are much shorter term. And we cannot let the almighty dollar or the last little bit of fishing that you think you can have change the course of the fishing future for these four anglers to be because they have 50 more years to fish. I don't have 50 more years to fish, but they do. And on my watch, our watch, we should be embarrassed if we don't give them better fishing than we had that our parents gave us. And I think it's, you know, critical that we see that difference and we take on that responsibility and we make sure that these guys that have no voice in the game right now have a voice and it should be ours. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's one thing I didn't mention. Maybe we talked about this too at the open house or something. But so right now, the rest of the lake would still be closed. It would be just like normal here. After, after two years or the four years or whatever, I, I would expect that this program would expand to maybe 100 or 150 lakes in Southern Ontario, maybe even in some states, but I, that's another story. Um, so that... Uh, you know, we'd have a much broader base. In in which case, once all those other ones, I would the long term strategy is to have these bass spawning sanctuaries in to protect the reproduction, but open the rest of the lake to legal catch and release fishing. I, I hate taking angling opportunities away. I love to fish. I do a lot of fishing. I do a lot of fishing, and um, you know, I I don't want to see that happen. 
And what that would do was that would that would that would put that would allow people to fish on certain parts of the lake, and it would also help compliance, right? Because if if okay, I can fish over here legally, or I can break the law, even though probably the fishing's better back in there. But I'm going to risk my boat, my trailer, and my car. You know, if I go in there, I think, and with a little bit of education, things will happen. I I've de dealt with a lot of angling groups in across the country and in, in other countries. I think 99% of all anglers want to do the right thing. They just need to know what the right thing is and why it why it is. The 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 myth that catch and release angling has no harmful effects, it's, you know, is a is a uh, a memorial to you know Ray Scott. I mean, he sold that hook, line, and sinker. You know, and true, it catch and release is a lot better than catching harvest for those fish, that's for sure, but there is a cost to it. We need to know that and play for it. So we couldn't do that. We couldn't open up the rest of Opinicon to legal catch and release fishing or the lineup at the boat ramp would be from here to the border. So that, but it could down the line. I don't think in these, these years, it would attract anybody because in fact, really when we talk about it, we're also gonna have a date that actually matches the date of parental care, the you know the the in 1990 the the fishing season opened in the last Saturday in June. Then it went to the fourth Saturday in June. So three years out of seven or whatever, it was a, a little earlier. But then it went to the third Saturday in June. So now it can open as early as the 15th. This year was the 18th. This was a really early spawning year. Okay, so it was probably as a good as one of the earliest we've seen. But there, not, there was not one smallmouth bass out in this lake that actually had reached the end of parental care by June 18th. And in Charleston, there isn't a fish in that lake, a male that reached um, the end of parental care. And in fact, we swam the, a day before the opening day in Charleston and the day before that here, and then came back and swam again in Charleston, 60% of all of the nests that were still active were gone by Monday. There was a point the size of this room that had seven males on it that were between 16 and 20 inches, all big fish, huge amount of fry. And then the day after that, there wasn't one male and there was no fry left in that entire point. My bet is, is that one boat took all of them because they were just there. They were on, you could see, you, you can see them, you know, coming away. So the the dates that would probably be for the sanctuary would probably be uh, maybe July 10th in Charleston, maybe earlier here, although the ministry wants to keep a single date. I, I suggested July 1st here. They bumped it back up to July 10th. So, but the rest of the lake would still be open to bass fishing. So this doesn't change the whole thing on bass. However, I would see that there, and from the discussions in the FMZ, 18 meeting, which is our fisheries management zone, that the opening day for harvest is is likely to be pushed back. They there, there's a pretty strong desire by a lot of anglers, not, a lot of cottagers, and everything else to push that back to to open harvest. Yep. What percentage of the which which what percentage of nests is that in the lake would make the more than zero. Uh, you know, I, it, that's it, that's unclear. You know, uh, um, so that's one thing that we could talk about. How you know how how much is enough? Um, but we're over fifty percent, and it, and if compliance is good and it bumps back up, then uh, we think that was, it, that's good. Basically, this is the the marine protected areas model and the the freshwater fish protection you know protection areas model that you know you show if you protect some area so that there's good spawning, that their sources and they just export, export young of the year so that the fishing is, even though it's a smaller area, the fishing is better put together than before the MPAs were there. And that's been shown time and time again. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh yeah, all over the country. Yep. Well, 
work. My brethren. Yes, I know. Well, to keep one. Yeah. But you, 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 you're going to get clients that. Yeah. No. I, I, well, it could be rental. But it could be rental boats. So you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. But most all of that fishing wasn't during the bass spawning season, right? Yeah. So out here in May and through most of June, or through or at least halfway through June, there really weren't very many boats. I mean, we have eyes on the. Pardon? Yeah. Pike. Um, okay. Right, but but and the the license sales were all over. But but for those two years, there the, where there were no Americans coming up, and actually the cottagers coming up from even Toronto and Ottawa were you know they was there was a uh, yeah it was they were discouraged from coming, and and there just really wasn't much fishing until the boat ramps were opened up and the marinas were opened up and stuff like that. So Opinicon and apparently most of the other lakes around, because we see that in every single lake we've looked at. That, but not during the spawning season. Not during the spawning season. Because they weren't. I, I mean, we've got, we had eyes watching how many, how, what boat traffic, the boat traffic out here was like non-existent. Yeah. Oh, sure. And crappies. Yeah. Well, with a spinnerbait this big there. Yeah. Right. So, so, but I, I, I agree that the Americans do contribute a lot and certainly a lot of the bass, bass specified catch and release, but it's not just the Americans because, uh, you know, but now I don't know that, I don't know that there's, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Well, ask Aaron, how many boats did you see during May and June? Yeah, right. Well, okay. Uh, now, I, I don't, this is the this is the data that we have from here, and that's that's what happens when you don't have fishing. So I don't know what the actual data are, were from Big Rito and Upper Rito, Rito, but the people from the uh, RLEF the, that we're working with, they say yes, it was good. There was not much fishing at all until summer really came until the end of you know end of june and then there was lots and then yes exactly but the the point is that maybe that maybe the experiment was only in opinicon and that's the only place we have data and that's the only place we did that experiment uh but it doesn't it doesn't matter if that if there was fishing in somewhere else because we're not going to do it then we would bring in these the sanctuaries the point is the dynamics of it this would save recruitment in some of these lakes. But what we have seen is that there is, you know, we think it's it's probably uh, had, a, had a COVID bump in, in lots of these lakes here, you know, so. And Sand Lake and Indian are also essentially predominantly bass lakes, stuff like that. Pardon? August 9th. And they, and they really didn't. You know, I don't think. Well, they weren't they weren't bass spawning bass. <laughs> you know, and it, it goes it goes back. It's interesting because it goes back to the history of you know Pennsylvania and New Jersey and stuff. They they had closed seasons, and New York had closed seasons. And when they closed the season, the lake was closed, so people could come up here and at least fish. You know, so I think that generated a lot of that cross traffic. And then the you know then New York based on one of those. The, the most the worst paper that I was referring to opened their fishing to catch and release 
only. Or, you know, during so that before the season spawns, it's open to catch and release fishing across the state now. Based on absolutely no, no relevance at all, but follow the money because the DEC paid for that study. I think uh, the pressure is like uh, the angling with the uh, river would just that increase uh, the nest or the, the bass release of nests and feeding nests with the gobies being more of a release predators at the nest as opposed to exactly. So, and that's why they're nesting so deeply because we we showed that there, in one area was a bass smallmouth bass factory that the average depth was probably a meter and a half or two meters they, they were a lot of fish were spawning up on this shelf but there were so many round gobies there and it was and and you know that that and they were getting and they were getting a lot of all of a sudden a lot of angling pressure and that the nests were being destroyed by the gobies and they just they were all of those were unsuccessful the ones that were down deeper we're not getting the angling pressure on them because you couldn't see them quite that well. So their survival was a lot better. So had, eventually now they're all spawning on the outside of these islands rather than the inside where it was shallow. Yes, the gobies are brutal. And and the brood predator load in the lake has a lot to do with the success of catch and release too. So this has a lot of brood predators here. Charleston has a pretty good amount too, but there are some other places that don't quite have that amount. But certainly introducing something like round gobies is really bad because they, you know, they do make the bass grow faster because they eat them, but they just really wreak havoc with their reproduction. Do you believe that the existing infrastructure in the lake enforcement is sufficient to handle what we have now? If you are implementing more closed zones and uh, protected areas, do you think that would require an increase in enforcement? Uh, and are there any strategies that you think would work better than others? That's a pipe dream though, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so it might it might take uh, some refocusing, because I mean, there aren't very many COs for a thousand lakes around here, right? So, but they could they could visit some of those. But the right now, they, the, the, the closed season is an unenforceable regulation. You have to have a boat in your, cooler or in your boat, right, to, to have broken the law. Because you could just say, well, I must be a terrible fisherman then, but you can't arrest me for that. I, you know, I thought crappies loved those giant spinner baits. Well, you know, so uh, you can't do that. This, if you're in there, if you're in the zone fishing, it's black and white, you're guilty. Now, th there, can, there has been in the past bad cottager angler interactions. You don't wanna have that, but, so, you know, that's why we would have pamphlets to go out and say, by the way, just so you know, I mean, so cottagers say, you're breaking the law. And, you know, there will be eyes on this lake. I can guarantee you, I can see a number of the eyes that will be on this lake while it's going. And there will be eyes in Charleston because the Charleston Lake Association, and they're, they're all behind this, right? So they'll go out and they'll just say this. And these days, everybody's got a cell phone. You're in this lake, it's got a date, it's got your boat number, it's got your face, and you go, you can leave now or we can call the OPP and, you know, and particularly if it's an American boat, you, you won't get across the border, right? You can stop. So, but what we don't want is fighting on the docks to try to settle this, which has happened before. <clears throat> Community-based conservation and enforcement in every corner of the world is the best way to have enforcement, but it takes education. So it's also an educational thing. I mean, most anglers, most bass anglers go, it's only catch and release. What can be the problem? But this shows that multiple times it's not, that it's not good for re reproduction. And in 2019, in that one year, now the average, they were every, each male bass out here on average was caught over four times. That's every bass, that's a lot. Right. Thank you, Connor. Connor swam Charleston with me last week. So he knows what's going on too. Um, uh, yeah, we, we were the ones that saw the, the disaster going on. 
Yes. I have no idea how those dates were picked. It was moved from the fourth to the third based on some argument called climate change. But let me tell you, climate change is real, but by moving it, that bit of movement was huge because really the clock on spawning starts at ice out. And ice out, okay, is maybe sometime in April. And now it's moved, you know, that's only, it, it's going from like eight weeks down to six weeks and they don't even start spawning. So yes, there needs to be realistic dates set. And ideally each lake would have its own date. Now there could be categorical things. So all of the shallow lakes around here would have a, a date of July 1. That would be probably good to protect most of the fish. Uh, that would protect most, and we have a paper out on 10 years of, of dates and when the seasons went in here, the St. Lawrence River, uh, Charleston, and the Mississippi River. And it shows exactly how bad they match up. I mean, the St. Lawrence River, they're still spawning. Eggs are still being laid right now. And the season in New York is, well, the season would have been open. It just got moved to July 2nd. But that's even ridiculous. I mean, I don't even know why there's a season in St. Lawrence, because what it does is it focuses that opening day syndrome right now when their maximum amount of nesting bass, maximum amount of nesting bass. So you get grandma and all the kids and everybody else. So you got six for grandma, you got six for this kid, you got six for that kid, and you go out and you just harvest the poop out of them that one day. And it's easy. So why would you do that? I, I don't get it, you know? And so, you know, and, and not everybody does that, but, th but on opening day, it's amazing. You see people walking around with stringers. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I've, I thought, I thought that was, I thought that was good. Cooper. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you're one of a rare group breed, and I believe I believe what you're saying too. But I, I, there, there are a number of people that are obviously going around fishing these bedding fish because there are 1,500 nesting bass out here, and they they've each been caught four times. There's a few people that are out there fishing them, you know. So, and these lakes can't stand an open catch and release fishing without without having a spawning sanctuary. There would that it would be it would be just like, and then everybody could be doing that and, and they could do it all day long. Right now, people that are doing that are always looking over their shoulder thinking that somebody's gonna come out and do that and say, and you know. Yeah. It it would to be honest, it would be easier and in, to enforce probably where there was going to be less traffic right there. But it really comes down to where the good nesting sites are, you know, so that you can have the minimum impact of taking away fishing with having 
by, by saving some for spawning. But I think without a spawning sanctuary, like or, all of these lakes around here, there is no one protected. And I, everywhere we've swum, Lobro, Indian, Sand, that th this level of fishing is going on and it's changing, it's changing the population. Uh, the, the, evolutionarily, they're changing and their behavior is going to change. You know, they're going to become l through fisheries induced evolution. They're going to have uh, less parental care. They're going to have less aggression. They're going to be harder to catch and we can go out and we can, sh I can show you, I you can take me to a lake and you can, uh, we can go and fish some nesting bass and in the way we fish it, which is five casts with three different lures, the same on every one. And I can tell you whether that's a private lake, a public lake, a public lake that's got a fishing season on it or a wide open lake by how many, because in a private lake, we'll have 97% of those fish hit that one of those 15 casts, 70% hit that first cast. And you go all the way down the line to something that's been fished in like Illinois or New York or whatever without a fishing season, et cetera, and 3% to it. So you, you can just see that. And, and that's, and it's not a behavioral change. It's they've become, it's an arms race. We have, a, we're a new predator for these, these individuals, extraordinarily new, like the last 50 years really has been what we're doing right now. And so they're fighting their evolution. So the big bad males that are going to get all of the eggs are the most easy to catch because they're so aggressive. I mean, these males come up, bite your hand, hit you in the face, you know, this and that. The first lure they see, bam, they're done. And we can go around and, you know, you can watch and go, that male's not gonna be here tomorrow. And he's not there tomorrow. So, and so that, and so, the, and, we, and we've shown through, pop, their populations are evolving to be less aggressive by having very reduced parental care because it's better to be a shitty dad, but a live one than, a great dad and a dead one, right? It comes down to that. So there's a, that arms race that's going on right now. It's no. No, yeah, but 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 the level of fishing has gone up, and the level of preseason angling has gone up because our the hook wounding rate. So we we're, we're monitoring the amount of fishing that's going on on nesting bass in the in these areas in these lakes by directly counting the the number of times they've been hooked. Yeah. Okay. No, but now now there's. Now there's four, four, five, tenfold greater numbers getting hooked or more often. I mean, they were, might've only been 10, 15 years ago, they maybe only would get hooked once. Now they're all getting hooked four times. And at the more times they're hooked, the more brood they have lost. And so abandonment rates are going, they don't even have to be harvested. They just are ab abandoning their nests. And so there's just not enough babies coming out. And that's what's happening. The under year classes for the last 20 years have been lousy. So that the numbers of adults that are maturing up are smaller. So they're getting younger and younger. And that's the only thing that's keeping the, the numbers as high as they are, which is 50% of what they were 20 years ago. So, and, and yes, they've been fished forever that way, but it's gotten out of hand now and we are different fishermen. We do different things now. We have all sorts of new baits. We have underwater video cameras. We have everything to make us better. And if you can't go out and catch 50 bass off a nest in an afternoon in this lake, right in the peak, as I said, you're lame. I mean, it's just, you can go into a cove. And I had a, I had an angler coming up, a scientist from Florida who works on the same type of stuff. He goes, we just don't see that. We, you, it's tough. Well, first of all, it's turbid as hell down there, right? So he came, came up and I go, oh, and he goes, wow, you can just see all these. Because there's a 16 incher, there's an 18 incher, there's a 12 incher. I said, which one did you catch fish first? That one. He caught it on the first cast. We had a permit. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
No, I, they start to ripen their gonads with their uh, with the the solar calendar, but here there's not that variation. So uh, yes, it's it's they, they they can start to ripen up, but they'll wait till 12 degrees thereabouts, and you know, and that depends on the amount of wind, right? So it's but and that's why like in Deadlock Bay, where they get warm influence coming in from Lowborough, coming down that log creek through Heart Lake, and then the creek here, the water in Deadlock is two or three degrees warmer than the main lake. They spawn there first. I hope I don't see you all down there next spring. Um, and uh, but that's that's exactly when they come in. And and then if it's if it warms up very fast, it's condensed. Some years out here, the but the date between the first egg laid and the last egg laid was nine days. But there was still five weeks beyond that last thing that they were guarding their fry. So, yes, you've been having your hand up, I know. <laughs> so largemouth bass like to spawn in shallow, weedier bays. For the most part, and th and they oftentimes spawn first, like in this lake and that, because they they go back into the shallow bays, and they don't make as nice a nest. But they they sometimes they'll make a make a pretty nice nest, but oftentimes miss it by a foot. <laughs> they're just they're just not very good at it. Um, but they but they also have probably five to ten times more smaller eggs than smallmouth bass. So they're back in the bays, and but there are mixed shorelines. You know, and if there's some weeds and structure, they like to be near that. The smallmouth bass like to be on gravel and with access to deeper water. So a uh, bunch of the islands that are pointing out and the shorelines that are pointing out into deep water uh, are really good. Shorelines that are open to huge wind fetch are risky, so they spawn deeper. But that area in Charleston is a whole bunch of islands with all rocky shoals all through it. And there are smallmouths all over there. There are little mini bays that have weeds, and there can be two or three largemouths in those little bays. But that one other area is a, ten, you know, t uh, three to ten feet big bay with clear stuff and reasonable shoreline, but but weeds all back in there, and and it's and it heats up. There's a stream that comes in, it heats up Annie's home, so it's it's a pretty good spawning areas for largemouth. That we were trying to find good areas in Charleston for large mouths. Here we're trying to find good areas for small mouths because that that to keep both of those going. Mm -hmm. I think that um, Dave's been answering enough questions. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I'll be around. Yep. Thanks.